So we haven't published the work, but we did still have the impact we wanted to have. Okay? And so that's part of the problems with being in academia. We have political pressure from outside powerful industry groups. And that's, the, that's something Steve has experienced as a faculty member here at UNC. But just because you have that political pressure from the external uh, groups, and maybe internally too, doesn't mean you don't do the work. Doesn't mean you don't keep you know, fighting, you don't keep advocating, you don't keep doing good science. And that's again something I learned from Steve. So I showed you um, a picture of Destiny Watford from Curtis Bay. I'm just going to go briefly into this because uh, I'm Andy, I'm looking at the clock. I haven't gotten to my research labs yet. <laughs> so Curtis Bay is a neighborhood in South Baltimore. Um, it's a neighborhood that uh, has a lot of heavy industry. And also it's near the port of Baltimore, so you have a lot of goods moving again. And also these peripheral support industries. Um, here are some of the facilities that, that are in Curtis Bay. Um, some of them, are, there's some super fun sites also in Curtis Bay. Like I said, the largest medical waste incinerator is in this community. So when you think about again environmental injustice, this community is a sort of a, a middle class community. Uh, I think it's primarily white, but also has African Americans, also a lot of immigrants too. But it's working class community. And so you look at their median household income, look at the disparity in median household income between Bay Brook, Curtis Bay, compared to the state of Maryland. Maryland is a very wealthy state, but we do have a lot of income inequality in the state. So when you think about environmental justice, again, many of these communities may be lower income, <coughs> right? That's part of the profile. Um, when you also think about environmental justice, many communities who are impacted by environmental justice also may have health disparities. That's why you saw my, my title slide, environmental justice and health disparities, because there's a connection between the two. So you see disparities in heart disease uh, between the Baybrook area uh, and state of Maryland and U.S., lung cancer, and chronic lower respiratory disease. Now, unlike most cities, you may be looking at this data and saying, well, Dr. Wilson, how did you get that data? Most cities do not do neighborhood level data collection. Baltimore actually uh, collects data on health outcomes at neighborhood level. Because usually when we get data, it's hard to get both below the sub county level, right? You may get some data at zip code level. Of course, you can never get data at the track level. Okay? But, so that's why we're able to actually track uh, burdens and exposures and look at disparities in, in and across Baltimore because they collect data at a unit of analysis that makes sense. And most of the time in our public health research, we use, this, we use census tracts as a proxy, but it's not really um, the best um, sort of example of a neighborhood. And then when I said earlier in the slide, so I was talking about uh, destiny in our community. Yes, you see in 2008, 2009, uh, 2007, 2008, when it comes to toxic air emissions, they were the most uh, toxic zip code out of, out of 9,000 zip codes in the U.S. So again, when it comes to environmental science, what, what is the cumulative impacts of that air pollution? What are the cumulative impacts of that air pollution? And what does that mean when it comes to human health? What's your study design? For those of you who are EPI students, think about the epidemiologic trap, proven causality. It's not exposure to chemical A leading to disease B. It's, exp it's exposure to chemicals A through ZZ and a multitude of diseases, various cancers. Can you say which cancer was due to what exposure? The lag effect, right? How does psychosocial stress the allostatic load play a role in it. The whole weathering concept. These are questions that we have to ask when you're doing the science. But again, we have to challenge ourselves to make sure that those questions don't stop us from doing good science and don't stop us from you know, contributing um, our data um, and our sort of expertise to solving the problem. So we have to have some precautionary principle embedded in this process when we don't know, we, we, we're not able to answer all the questions. So now let's transition to talk about some of my work in Charleston. So um, many of you may be aware of the Panama Canal has opened up. There's going to be more goods, more, more goods across uh, coming to the U.S. I think President Obama, one of his big plans is to have you know, these new trade agreements, as you know, some controversial for some recent trade agreements. But this is all related to bringing more, having more traffic, having more uh, movement of goods to, to in increase our you know, sort of economic uh, prowess when it comes to being an export and also import. But to do that, 
we had to open up our coastal ports. And so there's been a planned expansion of the Port of Charleston uh, for several years. And so the community group that I worked with, uh, the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities, was organized in two, 2005, again, in reaction to, like we hear in many environmental justice scenarios, a community group organizes in reaction to some type of insult, hazard, or local environmental land use. And so they organized to address the negative potential impacts of the Port of Charleston. Uh, but the interesting thing about, you know, Charleston itself, how many of you have been to Charleston? Raise your hands, please. Okay, you've been to Charleston. How many of you know about North Charleston? Raise your hands. Okay, very few people. So the next time you go to Charleston, start in Charleston, all the, with all the nice shops, with the is a Prada shop and some other nice shops in downtown Charleston. Drive on MLK Road and keep driving until it goes from 1080 HD, right, to Technicolor. When it changes to Technicolor, you'll be in North Charleston. And the reason I say it is, you, you know from a plan perspective, those of urban perspective, there's a huge difference because North Charleston, the border of North Charleston, Charleston, the quality of the roads changes. You have no potholes on MLK until you get to North Charleston. You see more trash. You see more K. You see a KFC for those of you who can recollect your last time you were on MLK. You see the coal fire plants. You start seeing brownfields if you can recognize a brownfield. Um, you see a lot of diesel truck traffic because of the goods movement. And so this community's profile is such where you have four Superfund sites. You have a lot of ink leaking underground storage tanks. You have several brownfields. They use the host and incinerator. So you have those hazards. They're also a food desert, okay? They have high crime, poverty rates as well. So think about my three-legged stool, right? They have all those issues. But they were organized in response to the expansion of the port, not these other issues, okay? But what we wanted to do in partnership with the group is to try to find a way to again to use the science to collect data that can help them revitalize their neighborhoods. So long term goal, uh, this partnership started when I was a, when I was a faculty member uh, at University of South Carolina. We got funding uh, from NIH, and the, the main goal was to use CBPR collaborative problem solving model to collect data and help address the problem, but also to get a baseline assessment uh, of human exposure to pollutants before the Port of Charleston expanded. Originally, the port was supposed to expand, I think, in 2015, and it was delayed in 2017. Now, with the new terminals will open in 2019. So, research objectives: uh, we want to assess the geographic distribution of environmental hazards, uh, pollution sources in North Charleston. Uh, what the community complaints was around: you have a lot of diesel truck traffic, which again is a major um, sort of characteristic of goods moving communities. You have a lot of traffic moving goods, so you have a lot of black carbon, a lot of PM, uh, particular matter being produced. So they were interested in learning more about pollution levels in the communities that are nearby the port activities and also nearby supporting activities because you had other industries again in the area. And then a, a big thing we want to do, as I said before, one of the biggest things that I, that I can do is help build community capacity to empower folks through education. So really trying to train uh, residents to be citizen scientists and collect their own data and basically you know, leverage their, youth, their lived experiences to, to be more engaged and have more impact in the problem decision making. So one of the things that we've done in this work is just do some simple chlorograph maps. Uh, nothing fancy, Mark, no Bayesian stuff. <laughs> uh, we're still trying to, the interesting thing about doing this kind of research, it takes a long time, you know, since that's been a question about funding. We got an initial grant to do some, some research. It was like a $1.2 million grant. That may sound like a lot. For the issues we're trying to understand and address, that's a drop in the bucket of what's needed. And so one of the first things that we did was to do some mapping um, and looking at patterns of burden across Charleston and North Charleston. And this is just a map that shows you uh, sort of the distribution of leaking underground storage tanks. And these, these tanks are, you know, tanks where you may have some type of commercial activity or industrial activity where you may have uh, storing some type of fuel source. And those, and those leaking tanks could, you know, leak benzene and xylenes and other contaminants that can impact groundwater. Uh, and also maybe carcinogenic, you have developmental effects and reproductive effects. And so we make this map as I show we see a disparity in the distribution, spatial distribution of these uh, lusts in the Charleston metropolitan Central area. 
And so a lot of times, you know, with some of our methods, we use these spatial methods to do mapping, to look at the spatial disparities and burden, and also spatial disparities and, and exposure. And so other approaches that could be used to do this work is kind of look at the distribution of hazards uh, in a host census tract or host unit of analysis, maybe a census tract, a block before a block or a county, and compare that to distribution of hazards in a non-host tract, block, block group or county, and then look at disparities that way. We can also look at the uh, do the cumulative distance uh, function analysis. We can also do a buffer approach to do a you know some type of buffer where you take a uh, think about the sort of zones of impact, the zones of exposure. So you're making some assumptions. So you take like a, a kilometer uh, radius around the facility or a two kilometer radius and look at the social demographic uh, composition within that that buffer around the facility. So these are some of the, some of the basic basic methods that are used to assess uh, this uh, disparities of burden. When we're trying to look at disparities and exposure, and we have access to the data, whether it be data, and we, that's one of the limitations of what we've done to this point. We've gotten some data, but not being able to get the spatial gradient and to do any type of um, interpolation, whether it be inverse distance weighting or some type of creasing or co creasing, is to create uh, exposure maps as well. Um, so we did do this host, non host approach and look at that, you know, prevalence in, of these facilities and host tracks based on these different social demographic characteristics and also prevalence in non-host tracks. And so we found disparities uh, based on looking at poverty, uh, percent non-white. And so this was, this was uh, repeated for toxic release inventory facilities. It was also re repeated for brownfields. And we also do use a, like a com composite approach too, to look at all of, like the cumulative uh, burden of these hazards and said that in disparities based on race, ethnicity, and SES. So this is sort of like the spatial mapping that you can do. And then, you know, kind of what we do, you know, after that is kind of drill down. Once we do this kind of this more global approach, that's drill down and do some type of monitoring. You know, the gold standard of monitoring would be doing personal monitoring. We didn't get enough money to do the personal monitoring, so we did more environmental monitoring. And so this map shows you uh, sort of the uh, interval facilities, uh, where we had our, our samplers at, we used a Partisol, a DICOP Partisol, which is a filter-based method to look at levels of PM2.5 in one inlet and then levels of PM10. And so we basically found that, we found that the levels weren't, be, weren't, be, weren't above the standards uh, in these communities, um, the annual standard or the daily standard for PM2.5. But the interesting thing is, we used a filter-based method, so it's a 24-hour sample. That may not be the best approach to use if you try to do personal monitoring, where you want to look at more acute exposures, right? So that's one of the things that kind of what we talk about with our part, one of our uh, government partners is DHEC, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. There's a difference between doing monitoring, regulatory monitoring, and exposure and health monitoring. So one thing that we want to do moving forward is actually do more personal monitoring to be able to see what are the levels of PM and other relevant compounds in the fence line communities at the household and the individual level? And then figure out what's the best epi design, whether it be a prospective cohort study, to see if we can see changes in exposure uh, over time. And then maybe even using a case crossover design for people who may have asthma, just to kind of follow them. So at times where there's high levels of PM, if there's any kind of health, health outcomes versus low levels of PM. So that's part of we, what we want to do is bring in some uh, more advanced study designs. But part of our challenge has been uh, we've submitted several grant proposals to the NHS, and at, to this point, uh, none of the uh, environmental epi centers have been funded. Okay. So one big part of what we've done, uh, and Andy, I'm down to, is that 425? Is that correct? Yep. Okay. <laughs> One, one of the things that, that we've done uh, in our project is uh, do a lot of education and capacity building through Project Excellence. So we have environmental health education workshops uh, on air pollution monitoring and the port expansion. We train community members to do GPS and GIS mapping. Um, this is some of the work we did back in 2011. We, that's Mr. Fraser Rahim. We trained, we, we got uh, community members trained as citizen monitors, so they got uh, city training you know, with the you know, human studies training. They got Hasbro training, and then we did some soil sampling at the incinerator, some of the heavily trafficked roadways, looked at uh, about 15 uh, trace elements, uh, primarily lead, arsenic, and mer mercury. Uh, we found that um, 
some of the levels of arsenic were above the uh, residential screening levels, um, the EPA screening levels. And so one of the follow-up studies that, we, that we're going to do, which hasn't been funded yet, we want to understand what are people been exposed to in their bodies. So we want to collect um, blood samples, we want to collect uh, hair samples to look at exposures uh, to some of these metals. We also want to do more environmental monitoring to look at the levels of these contaminants in their soil and in their homes and also dust inside the homes. So this is something else that we, we submitted to NHS as a proposal to both look at, to have an environmental monitoring component and also a biomarkers uh, component. Uh, we used, uh, for the, the project, project, the collaborative problem solving model, to basically take some of our data and then, okay, how can we act, use that data for action? So we have these work groups working on different parts of the project to kind of translate this data to action. And again, you see an education work group. Uh, we have an action solutions work group. Um, one that outgrows of our partnership. So originally, the primary community part, partner was the Low Country Alliance of Model Communities, Lamsey. But one of the outgrowths of this partnership was Seacraft. So a new community group was created, created by the community to be more of the community IRB, to be more of the group that worked on the research and getting the data and transferring the action and then working with LAMSI in the uh, implementation of their mitigation plan agreement with the state's Ports Authority. So this is a group that was created. One another so the outcomes of this project is this data was used to help shut down the Charleston incinerator. It also was used to help shut down a recycling plant that was going to be built on top of the old incinerator site. So that's a very positive outcome from the partnership. And we also created what we call EJ Radar. EJ Radar is an online uh, tool, GIS visualization tool. So all our data is online for the community to use. We have all the social demographic data for 2010. We have all the fast food restaurants, all the grocery stores. All we have data on NADA data, cancer risk data, also respiratory risk data, neurological risk data. We also have segregation data, I think, online. Uh, and so community members can map their data, and they can visualize all this data, look at patterns of, of burden, and use that for decision making. So go to the uh, town council meetings, and they begin to advocate for themselves. Uh, so this is a form of public participatory GIS. It's still in beta mode, and we're out, so we have another grant uh, that we're working on to get funding for, for this work. And this current grant is, we're trying to uh, get funding, proposal is, we're trying to get funding to create a real-time, community-based uh, monitoring network using what we call the AirBeam. The AirBeam is a low-cost sensor for PM2.5, also the MET1 monitor, and then that data will be beamed into a system uh, real, this is EJ Radar system for real-time mapping, and we're also going to have uh, uh, community members who have asthma have the uh, uh, David, what's David, uh, Sickles work, right, uh, to have a GPS unit, so when they have an a asthma attack and they use an inhaler, you'll have that data as well. So we're going to use EJ Radar to help with exposure management, exposure behavior management, uh, to help with asthma management, and also be used to, uh, for pollution reduction strategies. This is a proposal that we're working on right now for, it's a revision for a July submission to uh, NIHS. And though this is just a map, so DJ Radar, it like, it's in beta mode, but it's not just for Charleston, we have data for the whole state of South Carolina. So we train, um, we train residents to use EJ Radar, um, and it's, I think it's been very useful, and so we're trying to get additional funding uh, to, to expand the functionality of EJ Radar, so we can do some buffer and stuff and some other types of analysis. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I have a lot more slides that I can't cover. I told Andy, uh, I said I was tired, y'all, so I didn't talk fast. Did I talk fast? I didn't talk fast. So one of the things about doing this kind of work, there are a lot of lessons learned that, that we learned from our work uh, in Charleston. Um, the, the initial partnership was built on a relationship with a few members. So this group, uh, Lance, is actually, the leadership are actually uh, uh, black Muslims, okay? So it, it was built on, a, uh, so our partnership was initially built on uh, brotherhood, you know, being black men who wanted to do good work in the community, so we built these relationships. But we didn't have like a, 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 a really well-developed mission and vision statement starting out. Um, we kind of jumped into the partnership, and I, I started doing the CBPR training kind of late, and so that kind of was like a, not a, a, a great thing. As you know, as, as folks at, in academia, there's always resource disparities. 
uh, infrastructure disparities between academia, you know, institutions, academic institutions, and community groups. So we have some issues there, and uh, you know, and most community groups don't have their own IDC rate with NIH, right? So when it comes to overhead, that's another type of disparity too. And so, I man, I have these these lists of lessons learned, but. I mean, that partnership, even with some of these challenges, we've been able to overcome the challenges. That's one reason why CCREP was created, to help with better communication, and help with better facilitation of some of the research activities. And so I think it's been very powerful, you know, you know getting this work done uh, in LAMSI. And that partnership started back in 2007. I still work with LAMSI today, even though uh, we're now, now, now at the University of Maryland College Park. I had another example to talk about where, but um, I think I'll end there and take questions. Thank you. I mean, it's 4.30 if y'all want to stay for questions. <laughs> Any questions? It's a question in the back. Get those results to impact the community and still be able to publish yeah. because of embargo and all that. Yeah, I, I think I think part of this. So, uh, Emmett, uh, forget Emmett's uh, last name, but there's a there's a huge movement within environmental justice science and environmental justice scientists to what we call report back in community <coughs> protocols. So, part of it is you have to change the way you do your work and do community report back first. That's part of the ethics of doing environmental justice research. You shouldn't wait to do the reporting after you get published. That should be actually your first step is to report to the community. Because for them, that publication, to be honest, is not beneficial. One of my community members, the joke, his joke is, I'm not, I'm, this is not my joke, so I'm going to get the credit of Megan Wilson says, he calls publications toilet paper. That's kind of crass, right? But basically said it's not useful to us as community members. It's useful for us as academics. When it comes to our building our expert status, what's important for the community to leverage that, but it's more important to us. For them, so what we try to do is get our data out in workshops. I don't, I don't publish the data first. I, I translate the data into you know brochures, workshops, websites, media that they can use first. And so, but to get back to your question, I only have two publications for my dissertation. I always joke that I did two dissertations as a student here. I, my dissertation was actually on Hall K folks with Steve. But my other dissertation was working on Megan Wilson and Mevin. I have 10 publications for the work of Mevin. I only have two for, for my dissertation, Mark. Uh, <laughs> that's an inside joke. <laughs> so so you, can, you, you can still have an impact by translating this data into the ways they can use it and also still publish the work too. Okay. And actually, I think most of my papers that, that I have, I've published 47 papers uh, to this point in my career. 35 since I've been in Maryland since, since 20, 2011. Every paper where it's a community-based research project, I have at least one co-author from the community on, on that paper. In addition, almost every paper, I have a student. I have two PhD students now. One has 10 papers with me published, and another has seven. The one that has a seven, a 10, she's a candidate, the one who has seven is going through a qualified exam. She's not even started doing her research project yet. So you can still get published as a student. I have, a, I have an undergraduate student right now who's a co-author with me on four papers. He's also working with me on a chapter on environmental justice. He's a, he's a senior. So that was a lesson learned as a, as a UNC graduate. Only have one paper coming out of UNC. <laughs> so one of my things I want to do is make sure the students I work with, I mentor, are actually able to get published. That, that is important, but at the same time, you still can disseminate your work to the community still. Okay. Yes, ma'am. One of the things that I try to put when I work with the community is to try to explain to them that policy can only, when we try to make policy, it needs to be on peer reviewed research. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it helps to get that. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think the peer reviewed research is important. I think one of the things I learned when it comes to, so, we, so I work with a group of environmental uh, groups in uh, Maryland, and we've tried to get a cumulative impacts bill passed three years in a row. And we've used some of my research on, my research has been used in Maryland, so I published some papers in Maryland. We use other research, 
And the problem has been, the reason why those bills have been passed and they've, they've been defeated, we haven't had the social movement there. So we haven't educated enough of the impact of residents to be there. Even if it's not peer reviewed, just educating them of what the issues are and the patterns of exposure and burden, that empowers them. But we haven't done the best job of having that other group of stakeholders speaking for themselves. And I think if we do that, that'll help us get those bills passed. They need both. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I was struck that the president of your university asked you not to publish a study that you've done. Isn't that uh, a violation of academic freedom? So they didn't probably say it that directly, but that's how that's what I that's what I heard. And so, and I think part of the, the problem is when you're in you know, our school, of Health in Maryland is pretty new, so we don't have the cash chain of profile on the university that other schools do because you know Maryland's a land grant institution. So I think, and there's some conflicts there being in the land grant institution when it comes to agriculture and. The, 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 end of the chicken industry as a major support. So I think that political pressure led to receiving that letter. And I didn't, I didn't take it as an a, as a insult to anything, but I did see it as a, you know, a political issue that I was going to have to navigate. And so we, we did not publish it, but we did share it. We did disseminate it. And so getting into the community was my, was my first priority. And they, they got it. They used it. We had workshops and trainings. And they're still using information right now. So I think, um, it, I think it is a problem and that pressure, and I think Steve is dealing with that right now and has dealt with it before. And I think if you're going to do this kind of work, that's going to be one of the challenges you're going to always have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.